and I should be recording. There's a, there we go. If, if you don't see the, the recording button at the top, please let me know, because sometimes I just forget to push it. Um, okay, so again, materials are everything all around us in the world. Everything is made up of materials and all of them behave differently. So um, to understand how and why they behave differently, it helps to kind of look at how they're structured at an atomic and a molecular, kind of at a, at a higher length scale level. So um, right now we'll go through kind of the three main classes of materials, metals, ceramics, polymers, uh, and then I'll give a couple examples into how structure can affect properties with metals, ceramics, and polymers, and then I'll show you uh, a cool, uh, the, the flash that I just showed, material property plus, where all of the materials can be plotted in space. Um, so let's talk about metals. And again, I, I have typed up versions of these notes that I'll be posting to the canvas. So um, don't feel the need to take all of the notes take notes meticulously unless you want to. Um, and I apologize if I have bad handwriting. It again, things that I, I say should be in, in typed form somewhere. Um, so I think materials in general, you guys didn't feel as strongly on from the poll yesterday. Um, so metals, uh, hopefully you all know form crystal structures, generally form crystal structures that should be familiar. Uh, and those crystal structures can be, they kind of take a number of different forms. Uh, the most common ones, uh, simple cubic. So that is just a box with atoms at the corner. Um, simple cubic. Also, is that big enough for you all to see, especially in the back? That's okay. Cool. Um, is it legible? <laughs> that may be a separate issue. Um, simple cubic. It turns out almost no materials actually form simple cubic. No metals actually form simple cubic. There's only one, and it's polonium, um, which is a random polonium, which is a random metal that I don't think I've seen get used very often. Uh, most metals will form either a BCC or an FCC structure. So BCC is our body-centered cubic. So again, we have a cube. Um, and now we have, uh, we're going to have one atom in the center along with atoms at the corners. And that one we can kind of draw vertices to the corners. Body centered cubic or BCC. Uh, and so a lot of materials take on a BCC structure. Um, so this is our irons. This is our, uh, so iron, this is our niobium, vanadium. Um, it's a little bit more of a common one. Uh, FCC is actually probably the most common uh, atomic structure. So face-centered cubic. Da, da, da. Let's draw some shapes. Uh, this one has atoms in addition to the corners also on all of the faces. Uh, and this actually is a is a the most dense packing of atoms. So um, if you think about atoms as, as spherical balls, uh, FCC is, is the packing that it, you can get the most balls into a space with. Uh, face centered cubic, uh, FCC. Uh, and this one will be our, our uh, gold, silver, AU, AG, uh, magnesium, titanium, magnesium, titanium, zinc. Uh, so a lot more metals form this face-centered cubic structure. Um, on here so I can see the time. Uh, and then HCP, uh, so hexagonal close packed is the last um, semi-common one. Oh, sorry, mixing up notes. Ha. Uh, uh, or nickel. Duh. HCP is our, the last three that I just wrote, apologies. Uh, so HCP, we have a hexagonal close packed. So there's a hexagon that goes down. Um, do, 
There's atoms at the corners of the hexagon. Corners of the hexagon. Um, two inside there. And then there's three inside of the body here um, that kind of stack somewhere in between those. There's also two in the center of the hexagon. Um, apologies for my terrible diagram. Uh, there's better ones that you can look at in the notes later. Um, but hexagonal close packed uh, HCP. And this is our magnesium, sometimes titanium, uh, and zinc. Uh, that should have been over there. Um, so the more, more common metals that you're probably familiar with, copper, gold, silver, um, nickel are all FCC. Um, it's a, it's an easier structure to handle. The main difference between these is how anisotropic the materials are. So later on in the course, uh, maybe the end of next week, we'll start talking about anisotropy, uh, in elasticity. So you can imagine if you have, uh, a crystal packing that is somewhat irregular. So the, the way that now these materials fail, um, what do I want to roll back to? Uh, so let's roll back a couple steps. Uh, all these atoms in a metallic structure are bonded through metallic uh, bonds. So these all have metallic bonding, metallic bonding, and they fail via something called dislocations or plasticity failure. Plasticity uh, failure. And so basically metallic bonds aren't super strong. They're, you think of them as a, an, an electron glue holding all the atoms together. Uh, so it's pretty easy to move these atoms relative to each other. So when you apply a lot of stress to a metal, uh, these crystal lattices will actually slip. So what you'll end up with, let's move this up a little bit more. Uh, what you'll end up with is if I have a packing of crystals, something like this, um, in order to get plasticity to happen, there's something called a dislocation. So there's, there's some irregularity in the crystal packing. And so that, that dislocation we normally mark as, as a, a T or an upside down T. Um, here we go. And then in order for plasticity to happen, in order for those atoms to slide, um, this dislocation kind of slides along the material. So this dislocation will move through um, and then our crystal will become more regularly packed. Uh, da, da, da. And that extra plane of lattices, will, or extra plane of atoms will move out of the material. Um, so uh, depending on what your crystal structure is, those dislocations have different energies, have different uh, directional preferences. For uh, FCC, uh, there's 12 planes that these dislocations can move along. BCC, there's eight of them. HCP, there's, I think, also eight, but they're in weird directions because it's a hexagon hexagon packing. Um, that's all stuff that at the end of the class we can potentially get into. I think it's like one of the last chapters in the Myers and Chala book, um, but it's something to just kind of keep in mind for now. Um, and so uh, metals at the atomic scale form these crystals. Uh, at larger scales, those crystals then form grains. So uh, let's jump to, I'm going to show you guys an image of stuff. There we go. So this is an EBSD image, electron backscatter diffraction image of uh, metal crystals or of, uh, of, of crystals in a metal. So each of these kind of colored blobs is a crystal of a certain orientation. So you can see the, the box that's superimposed on there. That uh, That's the kind of box of FCC or BCC atoms. Um, the color corresponds to what direction exactly it's pointing. Uh, and you can see 
they form. These are microcrystal or uh, polycrystalline, uh, roughly 200, 100 to 200 micron size grains. Um, and each of these now, this is a, a polished metal, and you can see all of the different orientations of these crystals in there. So most metals that you see will take on something of this form. They're um, crystalline, but uh, they're, they're polycrystalline, and then they have all these different orientations of grains within them. So depending on what atomic structure it is, whether it's FCC, BCC, HCP, uh, and then what the dislocation or what the, what the density and size of the grains are, will all affect how, uh, how these things behave. And so in a few minutes, I'll show you an example of how that can actually affect mechanical properties. Uh, cool. Let's jump back to the back of the camera. Take a piece of paper. OK. So next, let's talk. Oh, also, I have things. This is probably useful. So um, examples of stuff. So this uh, is an aluminum dog bone or aluminum tensile test specimen. Uh, you can see that uh, when it was pulled, it started to neck. So you can see a narrowing region uh, in there. And then it formed a cup cone fracture surface, which is kind of typical of ductile fracture. Um, if you look really close, uh, you can see some of, if my hands weren't super wavy, uh, you can see some of the roughness in the surface. That roughness is actually grain sliding relative to each other. So this is an example of how that granularity can affect failure surfaces um, of things. And I'll pass this one around uh, for you all to take a look at. Uh, this is the ten uh, you'll do something similar in your tension test lab uh, in two weeks, three weeks. Uh, and then this is a 3D metal printed titanium specimen. So uh, it's it was made in the mechanical engineering department. So they made an M E, uh, ah, M E, and there's little M E's inside of there. Uh, when you have this was made with an E beam 3D printer. So um, those B printers use a powder. So you have a, a powder metal and then you center it with an electron beam together. So the outside of the surface is rough. Uh, and then when you if you take that and you uh, kind of sand away that outer surface, the inside is actually smooth and connected. Um, so there's five surfaces that are rough and one surface that's polished. Uh, and I'll pass this around over to some, some metal stuff. All right. Uh, ceramics. Let's talk about ceramics. So Ceramics uh, are now combinations of two or more elements. So uh, if you think like sodium chloride or calcium carbonate, Ca, uh, CAC3, uh, or kind of a, a variety of other things, silicon dioxide, that's a, that's a common one, um, table salt, uh, this will be ch chalk, I think. Calcium car. I think I have the formula wrong there. Uh, silicon dioxide is glass. So these are all materials that kind of exist around us. Um, ceramics also form a crystalline structure, but now because you have two or more elements, uh, they form uh, slightly more complex packings. Sometimes they can still form into simple ish structures, but often you'll get um, these sorts of things forming as interstitials. Um, so you'll have, say, a big atom, small atom, big atom, small atom, and the small atoms will fit somewhere in the middle there. Um, so this is, yeah. Sorry. So you're just drawing this line of what is ceramics differently than what I've heard before. Uh -huh. it's probably me just having this understanding, but like salt is yeah. ceramic, and so like, what? Where is the line between any material that has multiple? Right. So uh, it can be a fuzzy line, okay. but generally, so in addition to having multiple elements, it has ionic or covalent bonding. Okay. So that's that's the big, uh, if I can spell things, 
So for metals, for metal alloys, for example, you can have a whole bunch of metal ions that are all metallically bonded together that form different structures. Um, in a ceramic, you would have different elements connected via ionic or covalent bonds. And these ionic or covalent bonds are much, much stronger than metallic bonds. So that's why in a metal, when you deform it, it'll kind of smoosh, it'll slide out because th there's dislocations that it can accommodate in the crystal structure. Um, here, even though there may be dislocations in the crystal, those dislocation lines can't move because the atoms are so bonded together. Um, so you kind of pull on it and pull on it until it cracks because there's, there's no mechanism for to alleviate some of that stress via plasticity. There's also semiconductors, which is which can get a little bit fuzzy. Um, so like, or, or things like diamond, where diamond is carbon and it sort of behaves like a ceramic would, but it's not quite a ceramic and it's not quite a semiconductor. It's kind of like one of those odd materials. Carbon also forms nanotubes and buckyballs and graphene, all sorts of funky stuff. Uh, yeah, so that, that helps. so that's, yeah, there's, there's a whole lot of complexity in materials that I'm going to just very lightly scratch the surface of, um, but thanks, like, please, uh, if there are questions along the way, th thank you for asking, please just feel free to stop me and we can discuss stuff. Um, so, right, ceramics can form crystal structures, they can also be amorphous, so, uh, Things like silicon dioxide very commonly forms an amorphous structure, so still has different atoms of silicon and oxygen, um, but it doesn't necessarily form a clear packing, or it forms a packing, but it it's not as regular as it would be in a crystal. And so glass, uh, the glass like in the windows right there, is silicon dioxide, which in crystalline form uh, would be quartz. So SiO2 can be quartz when crystalline, crystalline, or it can be just glass when amorphous. Now, I'm gonna say this with a caveat. Uh, the thing that we know as normal glass, like window glass, uh, borosilicate or silicon dioxide, uh, metals and other elements can also form glassy structures. So you can actually have a metallic glass if you're, so metals, if you heat them up, will form kind of a, if you melt them, will kind of form a, a random pool. And if you cool that metal down fast enough, it'll actually lock that random structure into place. It'll be in that random structure will then be glassy. Um, and so metallic glasses then, because they have a random structure, have no mechanism for dislocations to move. They're very, very strong and also very brittle. Really interesting materials that I won't get into at all, but I'll just mention them. Yeah. Why does amorphous structure allow more light to pass through? Uh, because, ooh, that's, a, that's a, a deep question that you'll have to talk to a physicist about. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I want to say, so yeah, I'm, I'm not going to, try to answer it <laughs> I could try I could come up with like a, a made-up reason but I, I don't think it would be useful or correct yeah. so it almost sounds like the structure is more important than the constituent atoms or molecules sort of yes and no so so both of them are hugely important to mechanical properties because if you have different atoms they'll be stuck together stronger or weaker uh, and then they will have different energies that they'll be able to slide apart as a result. Uh, they'll preferentially form certain structures. So with a perfect crystal, that's that's kind of one shape that things can take. Uh, you can also have uh, defects in your crystal, like twins, grain boundaries, uh, and then the way that those form and the energies that those form also affect the properties. Um, there's a whole lot of depth that, again, we. I'll like scratch the surface of, and I'll try to mention as we're going through materials, I'll try to kind of keep relating things back to, this is how the materials are actually deforming, and this is, it has this grain structure and this uh, crystallinity, and that, that's why it's behaving this way. But, so, so yes and no, and it's complicated. <laughs> but, good question. I saw one other hand, yes. So, is the amorphous structure generally weaker than the 
generally, it's actually, well, it depends. If it's a uh, brittle material, like a ceramic, generally the crystalline structure will be stronger as long as there's not other defects. So brittle materials, this will be, um, I think, eighth or ninth week. We'll talk about fracture and the effect of imperfections in materials. Um, a perfect single crystal will be stronger than an amorphous material, but uh, any crack or void or defect will drastically weaken a brittle material, whereas it won't have effect on a metal. So, uh, yeah, it, it can be stronger or it can be weaker depending on defects and vacancies and, yeah, but also a good question. Other, I think I saw one more hand, maybe. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do a demo with a brittle material, the brain is right. And then I realized that we have some calcium carbonate right here in the class. Uh, I'm going to take a perfect chart. Let's see perfect chart. Uh, so this is also going to be a teaser for later on in the class. Uh, I think sometime mm, third week. Uh, so I'm going to take a piece of chalk and I'm going to bend it uh, and it's going to break brittily. So piece of chalk. Uh, and when I bend it, that fracture should be kind of flat across. So breaks kind of eh, a little bit of waviness on the surface, uh, but didn't provide much resistance. You can see maybe the roughness of the surface a little bit. That's um, again sort of the the crystal grain or the the grains uh, of the structure. Um, also, potentially any voids or cracks or imperfections causing that fracture surface to move the way it does. Um, I can pass chalk around. I don't know if you're super interested in chalk, um, but now uh, I take the same chalk and I'm gonna I twist it now instead of bending it. Um, that fracture surface should be, oh, there we go, uh, very different. So now we have this kind of funky spirally fracture surface. Um, so uh, this, I think, uh, fourth week is your torsion lab, fifth week is your torsion lab, something in there, um, where you'll be doing this experiment with metals. So you won't see this type of failure, but we'll talk about this again uh, when we come up to that point. Um, and why that failure, why it failed that way. Ah, okay, um, let's jump to polymers. Oh, we're already spending way more time than I was hoping. Polymers. So, uh, polymers uh, are long chains of molecules that are then bonded together. So, uh, poly equals many and mer here is a uh, molecule. So we have lots of molecules kind of bonded together in these long chains of things. If I can draw properly, that's not drawing very properly. Um, so these polymers can form a whole bunch of different structures. Uh, the simplest ones, linear structures, uh, it can form a branched structure, so you can take a linear one and have branches of stuff going off of it, um, depending on what molecule is exactly. Uh, lots of polymers kind of form an amorphous structure, so what is basically molecular spaghetti kind of bonded together. Um, so these long chains of polymers kind of randomly oriented and potentially bonded. Um, when you have this sort of amorphous structure, there's different degrees of something called uh, cross-linking, which affects how strongly, or which, which is basically as, as these polymers come into contact with each other, they're then more or less strongly bonded to each other. Uh, polymers can also form um, stacked structures or, or striated structures where it kind of will form a, a periodic packing like this. So something like this would be a more crystalline mer, um, where now uh, uh, the elements on one end of the polymer chain would be uh, attracted to the elements on the other end, so it forms a nice wavy structure. Uh, it can also form a linear structure if you take it and you stretch it out. Um, 
So these are all kind of different shapes that polymers can take on. Polymers are incredibly complicated. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that can happen with them. Um, so I have a couple examples of polymers here. Uh, so this is a this is a dog bone specimen of acrylic. Um, so that clear polymer, you can see it, it kind of forms a nice clean break. It's a it's a relatively brittle polymer. It's amorphous and fairly highly cross-linked. So what that means is um, it forms this random structure, and then uh, when I when you pull on it, there's not a there's not a lot of wiggle room for the polymers, so it uh, kind of just cracks uh, because those those polymers can't really slide at all. Um, so acrylic. Uh, then we also have here's a sample of polycarbonate. So this is another transparent polymer. This is actually what your safety glasses are made out of. So where are your safety glasses? Um, and these started off at the same length. So what happens is with this polycarbonate, uh, it's also amorphous, but it's not as highly cross-linked. So when you pull on it, the polymer will act, the molecules will actually start to stretch in, in the direction that you're pulling it. So now if you, if you image the molecular structure of this, there'd be more aligned uh, polymers along the length of this thing. Uh, and it stretches out up until uh, it, uh, those, they're, they're relatively aligned and then they break. Um, so I'll pass these two around. Uh, so you can see, or maybe chalk, I'm going to give you. Uh, that's actually normally what we use for our uh, tension demo, or our, our tension lab. We would do uh, an aluminum, a steel, and then a polycarbonate and an acrylic. Uh, this year, we're actually going to try out uh, carbon fiber instead. So I'm not actually going to show you notes on this, but this is another. So they're those basic combinations of materials, metal, ceramics, polymers, um, there's a lot of complexity around. Uh, carbon fiber composites, or composites in general, are, are combinations of two or more types of those materials. So carbon fiber is one of the most popular composites nowadays. Uh, this, you can see at all, it just looks black, um, but I'll pass it around. This is a 45-45 a a weave of carbon fiber, so carbon fibers. Uh, this is one of the many forms that carbon takes on. Uh, are long strings of relatively aligned graphitic sheets um, into a fiber that's like five to eight microns in diameter. There's then thousands of those that are woven up and then uh, bonded together with epoxy. So you're taking a carbon and a plastic uh, carbon, which is very strong but very brittle, epoxy, which is not as strong but a little bit more ductile, and you're combining them to get some sort of property out. Uh, this is a short fiber version, which, oh, you can kind of see. So uh, this one, they take sections of carbon uh, carbon and epoxy, chop them up into chunks, and then uh, bond them together in this semi-random structure. This makes the material more isotropic. So carbon uh, is very anisotropic, because whatever direction the fibers are in is super strong, and any other direction is not. Uh, this one makes it a little bit more isotropic. Um, and then uh, at the sacrifice of making it a little bit weaker, uh, this is a nice example of a puck that had been bonded and formed. This is a woven, nope, still can't see anything, cool. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is a woven carbon fiber puck. Uh, one side is the tool steel, one side is the vacuum bag uh, when they formed it, but if you look on the side, you can see the layers of it that got stacked up. Uh, and then this was a woven W, can you see it? Maybe, maybe a little bit. Uh, another carbon fiber weave uh, that they stuck stuck on a water jet and cut into a W. So I'll pass these two around. Um, cool. So let's see. What do I want to talk about? Let's go through a couple examples. Uh, examples first or demo first? Let's talk about examples. Okay, so, oh. That's really annoying. Every time my computer screen turns off and I bring it, wake it up, it switches back to that. That's slightly odd. Okay, um, so there's two nice examples of how structure affects mechanical properties. Uh, one with polymers and one with uh, metals. So, 
our first example is going to be polyethylene versus something called dyneema. So polyethylene versus dyneema. So polyethylene itself um, is one of the more simple polymers. Uh, it's carbon and hydrogen. Uh, carbon bonded together with hydrogens sticking off the side. Hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. And this kind of goes on forever. Uh, one of these, uh, or I guess two carbons and four hydrogens forms one ethylene molecule. Uh, and then the long chain of these is, a, is the polyethylene. Uh, and then the structure of this drastically affects the properties. So normal low density polyethylene, low density polyethylene, PE, uh, forms a semi-random amorphous structure. So we have our, our molecular spaghetti that's nothing uh, super interesting. Uh, this will generally have stiffnesses on the order, Young's moduli on the order of like 0 0.2 gigapascals and yield strengths on the order of like 10 MPA. It's not particularly stiff, it's not particularly strong, it's pretty cheap, it's easy to make, it's a, it's a simple polymer, it's used pretty commonly. Um, now there's another version of polyethylene called Dyneema. So, Dyneema, uh, which they actually make uh, climbing rope out of and ripstop uh, tags and, and lots of really strong uh, tensile stuff made out of plastic. Uh, and Dyneema, actually they take polyethylene, they stick it through a die and then they stretch it out and you end up with these polyethylene chains being very, very highly aligned. So like almost perfectly super highly aligned polyethylene molecules. Uh, and this Dyneema actually has Young's moduli on the order of 110 gigapascals and yield strengths on the order of 3500 3, MPA. So three orders of magnitude higher stiffness, two orders of magnitude higher strength. Um, it is way, way stronger and way, way stiffer just because we turned that polyethylene from a spaghetti into something that's aligned. Um, so you can imagine kind of the spaghetti out of the box while it's still nice and straight versus after you've cooked it and it's kind of a mouche uh, in your, in your, on your plate or in the pot. Um, and that can drastically affect mechanical properties. So this is a fun example. Yeah. Typically in backpacking gear, we'll see Dyneema, it's DCF done in Dyneema composite fabric, but it's, yeah. it's actually a polymer, it's not a yep. composite. Yeah. So fun stuff. They actually make dy uh, Dyneema polyethylene composites. So it's polyethylene, polyethylene, but they have the Dyneema fibers with the polyethylene matrix. So it's a polymer, polymer composite. Um, but it's the same material, just differently structured. Yeah, it's real fun, fun stuff. Um, so, other questions, thoughts, comments? Cool. Uh, so the other example that I'm gonna show real quick is cold rolled uh, copper. So. Uh, cold rolled and annealed copper. Cold rolled plus annealed uh, copper. So, uh, cold rolled and annealed copper, when you start off with a metal, again, it kind of has these big grain structures in it that uh, some are small, some are big. Uh, they form semi-randomly. Uh, depending on exactly the heat treating conditions that you put them through. Um, but then a lot of the time for engineering applications, we don't want big hunks of copper that are, or big hunks of whatever metal that are coming out of the forge. Uh, we want long sheets, bars, uh, whatever. And so uh, one of the techniques for changing the size is rolling. So you basically just take two giant hunk and rollers um, you squeeze this material through, and in the process of squeezing it through, you change the grain structure. So generally, when you squeeze it, the grains become more highly aligned in the direction of squeezing, uh, kind of similar to how our, our plastic behaved. Um, so they get stretched out, they get small, they get made smaller, um, and then after uh, it gets stretched out and squeezed. Uh, generally what you'll do is, is heat treat it. So at some point after rolling, 
there's some heat um, and what that does is uh, coarsen the grains up, makes them a little bit bigger, uh, uh, and removes some of that anisotropy. Uh, so this this anisotropy will uh, we'll potentially talk about third. Well, well, we'll talk about it a little bit third week. I don't know if we'll talk about it explicitly in the context of metals, um, but it's not necessarily ideal. Properties can be pretty drastically different. Um, in different directions. So you want something a little bit more isotropic. Uh, and what happens now with this, uh, after heat treating and, and rolling, the grains are still smaller, uh, but they're a little bit more isotropic than they were immediately after this. Uh, and what can happen actually, there's a, there's a paper in 2002 that I've linked in the notes um, on an example of cold rolled steel, cold rolled copper that had been heat treated uh, to different degrees after rolling. And so initially the copper um, kind of had a long plastic behavior. Uh, so this is uh, failed at maybe like 50 uh, MPA uh, after rolling in the direction. Um, it had a very high stiffness, but not a lot of ductility. So here, um, let's say this is like 50% strain this is strain, this is stress. Um, so here, uh, it's, our copper wouldn't be very strong, uh, but it had a lot of ductility. After rolling, it was very strong. The grains were a lot smaller and they were more aligned, uh, but it didn't have a lot of ductility. Then after annealing, what you see is you sacrifice a little bit of the strength, but you get all of the ductility back. And so this is our uh, normal or uh, as cast, roll, cold rolled, and then cold rolled plus annealed. And if you anneal it too much, you'll actually end up back uh, somewhere where you were originally. Um, but here, this is something like 350 MPA now yield strength. So you can, you, by cold rolling and annealing, you can drastically affect uh, the mechanical properties of your material. Uh, this, uh, there's another factor that's coming into play here, or one big factor that's coming into play, which is called the Hall-Petch effect. Um, which, has anyone heard of Hall-Petch before? Yeah, maybe. Okay, so there's, there's something, this thing called the Hall-Petch effect. Uh, which basically says um, when I change the grain size of my material, so if I have some characteristic D, which is uh, which is a grain size, uh, my corresponding yield strength will start off pretty low, and then will actually kind of continuously increase as I decrease my grain size. So we have this. Um, this is proportional to uh, 1 over square root of D um, increase in strength as I, as I decrease size. So in the process of cold rolling, I'm making my grain smaller, uh, and so that's reducing this size uh, and then making it stronger. The idea here is that in my grains, I have dislocations that want to move around. So I have a dislocation that wants to kind of pass through. If I have a smaller grain, I have that same dislocation in there, but it can't really pass through that tiny grain boundary. So it gets stuck at the grain boundary and you have this pileup effect. There's actually an inverse hull patch effect if you make things too small. So um, it'll get smaller again. Uh, this inverse effect happens around like 10 nanometers. So if you make your grain smaller than about 10 nanometers, it, actually, the, the volume fraction of the grain boundary will start to dominate your strength um, because the grain boundary isn't crystalline. It's, it's that kind of weird amorphous thing. So there's less atoms packed in there. So the grain boundary itself is weak. Um, and so this beneficial effect of having dislocations get stuck goes away and um, you have something, uh, grains that are able to slide through. Um, here, this would technically be a, a, an amorphous strength. Um, so amorphous materials because there's less stuff uh, generally would be weaker. 
this isn't actually necessarily the case. There's probably actually another tick up here at the end um, as it's amorphous, but uh, again, it's, it's complicated depending on the structure. Cool. So uh, we have maybe five minutes left. I'm just going to do a poll everywhere. Uh, maybe I'll do it the next day. But uh, there's one thing that I want to introduce you guys to early on so that you get a chance to see it. And that is this software called CES Selector or CES EduPack. So this is on the College of Engineering site. Um, so there's the Mechanical Engineering Remote Desktop that has SolidWorks and MATLAB and uh, what up, FEA programs. There's also the College of My Site uh, that has Mathematica and Maple and a handful of other things. Uh, this CES EduPack is one of the things on there. So uh, this now is a software developed by Mike Ashby from Cambridge. So uh, Mike Ashby, uh, maybe 40, 50 years ago, had the idea that there's all these material properties, but it's really hard, like comparing them is difficult. We just kind of have this intuitive, oh, metals are strong, ceramics are brittle, and polymers are kind of ductile and soft, um, but there's, there wasn't really a good comparison. So we came up with this idea of putting things in plots in terms in property space plots. Um, so uh, I can generate one of these for you. Uh, so he created he created this idea of, of material property plots where you where you characterize materials. This is now an example of uh, modulus versus density. So this is heavy stuff is stiff, light stuff is not so stiff. Um, so you have ceramics which are very stiff and very heavy, metals which are stiff and heavy composites which are stiff and not as heavy because there's some polymer in there, polymers which are lighter but not as stiff, foams which are very light but very not stiff, elastomers which are super stretchy, um, so they're heavier but about the same density as polymers but now drastically lower stiffness. Um, and so all of a sudden we can see how all these materials look in relation to each other. Uh, you can get a kind of very quick intuitive idea of, of what mechanical properties are what, where things overlap. So like metals can be denser or less dense than ceramics, uh, for example. Uh, there's nothing really less dense than water th other than natural materials. Um, water is a thousand kilograms per meter cubed, which is this point right here. Um, and so over time he created this company, Granta, uh, that specializes in making these material property plots. So these are kind of incredibly impressive uh, this is an incredibly impressive software package, but let's say I want to look at mechanical properties. So I want to look at, uh, let's, let's do something else, hardness. I want to look at hardness on my y-axis and I want uh, something weird. Let's say thermal properties, I want maximum surface temperature on my, on my x-axis. It creates this, this property plot. I can make bubbles of all these things, turn them on and off. Uh, when I have these bubbles, I can drag things off and say, oh, these are my ceramics, these are my glasses, these are my metals. If I hover over a particular bubble, uh, I get what that particular bubble is looking at instead of just the gross category of materials. And then if I double click on that, I actually get a pop-up of where that material is used and then its properties. So in the course of this course, again, uh, in the, going through this course, we'll learn all of the, what all of these properties are, how they're defined, what they mean, uh, generally how they measure them, and in, in the labs you'll, you'll get an idea of, of how they're measuring them. In this software, you can click on that uh, information button and it gives you that definition kind of right off the bat. So Young's modulus uh, is the slope of the elastic loading, or the elastic slope of the load, stress strain loading curve uh, for engineering stress strain. Um, fracture toughness is a little bit more of a complicated one, uh, but it's the, the resistance of this thing to a crack propagating and how much energy it can absorb, for example. Um, thermal properties, electrical properties. Importantly, uh, he started to focus on uh, cost in this. So for any of you who are in design, um, if it wants to scroll down for me. Uh, he's started to look kind of in, in recent years at, or his company has started to look at what the cost of materials in is, where they come from, whether they can be responsibly sourced. So that's a, a huge issue. 
So like something like indium tin oxide, ITO, which is in all of your cell phones. Um, indium only comes from certain places in Africa, which are mined in Africa, which are also conflict zones. So you have to pay money to these warlords that are overseeing these conflict zones to get tin, uh, indium. So stuff like that, where it's like, oh, well, all of a sudden this puts materials in a different perspective. Uh, and he has, oh, here we go, geoeconomic data, materials processing, how much energy it takes, the CO2 footprint, how much, it, how much energy it costs to actually make a pen, for example. There's inside your pen, there's plastic, there's metal, there's rubber, uh, there's probably not ceramics. Um, but where, what materials are they? Where do they come from? How much does, how much use of them cost? What's the footprint? That's all in the software. Oh, <laughs> property plots, phase diagrams, uh, back to material science. So anyway, this is an incredibly impressive software. You should, I can spend hours and hours just scrolling through this on my own, but I wanted to at least introduce it to you all today. So you get a chance to look at it later. <clears throat> CES EduPack. And it's on the it's on the College of Engineering software suite. Okay, thanks everyone. See you on Monday. I'm sure I can just look this up, but so I love up section. Yeah. It's like it's uh, one of the things that I'm wait. But what, what intrigues me is that it seems like it should be heavier. Yeah. Because the molecular density of it's folded that much.